Uh, my name is Juan Puentes. I'm the original founder of White Box in 1998 in the then um, new neighborhood of Chelsea. Nobody thought there was going to become a hub, the center of the art world with 400 galleries plus, etc. in those days. Um, since the introduction was so explicit about what White Box is, etc., etc., I'm not going to waste time since I only, only have 18 minutes left. Yep. So um, I completely, two days ago, I chopped uh, my talk. I wrote all these things while I'm you know, coming here a week prior, etc. And then I asked myself, who actually uh, hold the voice? Who gives meaning to my labor as the white box uh, creator, founder, and artistic director? I said, well, my constituency. My constituency is about 13,500 people that sign up and get our emails, newsletter, etc. So in view of that, I decided to write to about 50 artists, uh, jurors, a uh, judge, uh, collectors, uh, educators, uh, losers, bombs, etc., that uh, come by white box. And I know pretty much all of them. Um, I received, I don't know, a couple hundred responses. So I picked up 14 of them. And uh, they are the following people. Ulai of Ulai and Marina Abramovic. Uh, the latter one has become a brand political economic uh, force. Um, he doesn't remain that at all. Sol Ostro, Blanca de la Torre. Entry Sol Ostro has been the editor of Bomb magazine and many other things, including Critical Practices Inc., a collaborator of White Box. Kyle Goin, one of the most uh, fabulous um, political activist artists, part of the Bot group. Uh, that took over the Guggenheim and demanded um, one Saturday night, uh, a free night, f um, pay your workers in Abu Dhabi while they work on your new fabulous museum. Okay, just pay them and also give them health insurance and a good housing, etc. Joaquin Segura, one of the most prominent hard ass um, Mexican um, artists, you can call him very politicized, he calls it, not political or activist. Abelino Sala, likewise in Spain. Elliot Sharp, one of the most fabulous composers living in Berlin and New York. Elisa Mohamedou, uh, princess from Mauritania, um, and PhD in too many things, uh, including economics, and she works in the third world, uh, trying to find out means and ways to uh, electrify the world so they can get water, etc., etc. Loves art. Gail Elston is a, a Prodigy, um, Carol Schneemann, Dennis Oppenheim, etc., was their lawyer, and this is in the university in, in Zurich, um, the, univers the International University. And Honorable Stephen Honigman uh, is a judge, friend of the house. He defends white box in front of many problems we have to remain uh, with our doors open and being charged too much rent, too many expenses to run the place. Um, and has been the third man in the U.S. Navy who has uh, helped immensely um, new films on why whales die, beach themselves due to the sound that the Navy and 62,000 ships around the world produce. I watched Black Ink uh, two nights ago. Uh, Greenpeace was fabulous. You should join them all. Okay, so I'm going to start um, because I changed um, gears entirely and I'm just going to quote a few of these fellas on the four questions at hand, uh, white cube versus public space, I'm going to erase myself from here. Unfortunately, the um, images I had for you uh, don't correspond. So I'm going to do a very stream of consciousness. Remember, Jackson Pollock, the Abex, uh, Freud, Jung, loved it. <laughs> so I think you're north of that territory. You should love it. Right here is. Uh, Kyle Goyne, Dred Scott, and a bunch of hard-ass political uh, artists in 2008 when uh, we had elections. Um, what was that? Obama, <laughs> black candidate, and McCain with uh, the Canadian cat. You know, they decided, let's do sedition. We didn't have a doorway yet. We didn't have money, $7,000 to make a door, so we kept the cooler door plastic. And there was a fabulous uh, show uh, sedition, Wafa Bilal and company. I was just impressive. And Martha Rosler came to VJ the returns. Uh, Fox News on the right and CNN <laughs> on the left, sort of thing. 
and it was a fabulous thing. I plan to do more sedition for October into November 8th. And I'm not going to tell you who's going to be there, but many of those uh, guys. Go on to the website, whitebucksny.org, see 2008, what was going on there. It's just amazing. You'll see some images here. Yeah? Um, so that was sedition. Uh, this is uh, Conrad Atkinson, one of the men have, who has influence. Um, Tim Rollins, um, uh, Alfredo Jar, and myself. Native American whispers can be heard on the soundtrack of every Hollywood movie. And White Box adheres to what he says. We are always constantly contesting. The landlord, the neighbors, uh, 230 uh, commercial galleries in the new museum in our neighborhood. Um, used to be seven, eight years ago when we abandoned Chelsea after 10 years and 400 galleries later. Um, so they're chasing us um, everywhere. There's no escape. This was sedition. You can be looking at the artist there. While I began to quote Ulai, who just wrote me five times, and I just met him um, two weeks ago when he came back after 25 years absence from the marquee, and he did a beautiful performance called Some Can't, Some Can't, Others Don't, in Red Hook, an upcoming neighborhood soon to be spoiled by developers. Yeah? So Ulai, answering to these four questions, says, just a short note prior to my answers to your questions. Once, Joseph Boyce and me visited Northern Ireland out of solidarity to the problem. Northern Ireland was a gunpowder barrel. Joseph walked the city, believe it was Belfast or Londonderry, dressed in his typical clothes, carrying a red rose. A Northern Islander approached, asking, what is that about? Joseph answered, I am an artist. The Islander replied, fuck off. <laughs> so um, Ula came up with aesthetics without ethics is cosmetics <laughs> after that <laughs> incident. <laughs> And furthermore, he says, the decadence in chick representation of the gilded white cube galleries is not my cup of blood, really. I don't fit them, and they don't fit me to say it's short, so I cannot address your questions. You know, um, in terms of political commodities, also sounds strange, and I do believe that most, if any political issues at all, discussions or disputes, are always carried outside the established ivory tower. That was Ulai. If I can move this page. Okay. Saul Ostro is the editor, author of um, Bomb Magazine, a magazine dedicated, um, based in Brooklyn nowadays, uh, to have artists really write about artists and interview them and so forth. He's a social thinker and one of my most favorite men. And, and remains a Marxist without apologies. So he begins answering the questions by his own narration. He says, Juan, let me start by saying that this is all premised on a false dichotomy, this project. Uh, the cultural sphere is always already political in that culture is the sphere in which we confirm or propose values, standards, and criteria. In this sense, Jeff Koons and Richard Prince are two of the most successful political artists we have. And then he answers, for real. Uh, what is the difference between presenting art with a political perspective in an art space versus presenting it in a public art space? Many subdivisions, I pick two only. And men, men, well, I'll give you one of the latest shows we did, Make America Great Again. Um, we have a specialty at White Bus, which is called an ad hoc programming. Whatever goes on in the world, I say, what the hell? Uh, we push the next show into the future, or we lose it, and we lose funding, and we do this. So <clears throat> when I heard um, <clears throat> Trump, I was in Montenegro, uh, say, I could shoot someone down Fifth Avenue and don't lose a vote. I called the office, and I said, cancel the next show. Raul Zamudio and me will curate in Blanca de la Torre from Mexico and, and Madrid, will curate uh, Make America Great Again. We selected the hashtag because everybody who wrote us back, hundreds of thousands, didn't come to us, the White Box. It went to his office, to the Trump Tower. So I don't know when they, I hope, to get the, <laughs> the material. <laughs> yeah. um, 
And there you have it. <laughs> I cannot explain that. So Solarstroh says, and uh, number two, again, this question reveals I its political bias. Art, cultural spaces and public spaces both, the differentiation that in actuality needs to be made is who are the publics to, for the various types of social spaces we occupy? Not the spaces, but the publics. I agree with that enormously. And the difference between announcing a social view in an institutional space and out on the street should be obvious. Out on the street, the audience is a chance one. In an institutional space, the audience is more likely purposefully there and you potentially will have 45 seconds to catch their attention. This is our present show, Natalie White for Equal Rights, a lady who came off tangent, um, like a bimbo sort of thing, with Peter um, Beer and all that, uh, lawsuits right and left, and came to me, approached me with this idea <coughs> of um, demanding equal rights for all women in the USA. The USA is one of the nine countries around the world, including Sudan and Iran, and a few Pacific islands that have not ratified the UN mandate to treat women in the same way as men. So I decided, let's do it. The text is there, you can read it, that's her. And there's a um, five and a half meters by nine meters long American flag hanging at White Box right now. On July 8th, there's self-portraits naked and then on July 8th, I returned to start a march to Washington, D.C., to the Capitol. Uh, Chelsea Clinton, we hope, is going to be coming to us via Honorable Stephen Honigman. Patricia Arquette and all those ladies and Natalie are today in Washington meeting and watching a movie and this um, item. Yeah? So Blanca de la Torre um, from Artium in the Basque country of Spain um, answer number one question. How are political messages communicated within a space devoted to presenting art? She says, I think we have to distinguish political art and art made politically. It is the same as when Godard uses the remark um, differentiating a political film versus to make political films. The effect of the political messages also change depending on the space. A space that doesn't have a coherence in the exhibitions and doesn't have a coherent program related to politics will never be taken seriously and therefore the content will not be taken seriously either. And uh, number two, she says, the difference in presenting art with a political perspective in an art space versus the public space, the difference is just in the attitude of the artist, the curator or the organizer but in reality, other factors affect as public space in theory is more connected to the public. But maybe first we should clarify what is public space. I like the definition by Hannah Arendt. Public space emerges whenever and wherever men act in concert. That was a Bayview project. Um, I found out when I moved to Chelsea in 1997, got the lease for white box at my buddies backing me up, ideologically, etc. And I found out we have a fabulous uh, women's prison right there on 21st Street and in front of the Chelsea Piers where everybody goes to sunbathe and do a sports and drink and things like that. There it's sat. Bayview Correctional. They spent the last two years of their prison sentence. 95% are black and Latino, no Asian, and almost no white women are there. For a year and a half, I brought Brian McGuire from Ireland. He had been um, um, castigated for trying to burn the academy in Dublin upon um, uh, doing his masters, because they were retrogrades, and, right? Uh, they, in the years, we had thrown him in jail for years. In Ireland, they sent him to Belfast, and he worked with all the gunslingers. So he was very well versed on dealing with prisoners, but had never done anything with women. I was not allowed to go into the prison. For a year and a half, he came. He painted the portraits, and they painted their fabulous dreams, ideas, etc. By the time we did the show, three were free, and they came to the, um, to the talks at White Box. Um, 
some nice soul gave us uh, $10,000 for public relations, and we had several articles in the Times twice, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's another point I don't want to touch on because I had a discrepancy with an artist the other day around the corner that um, we don't need uh, public relations firms in order to function properly in New York. I was denied by the new, mu by the new School of Social uh, Research uh, to bring uh, our talks there because I did not have a public relations firm. They would not talk to me after having drinks and getting drunk with the two ladies who ran it. Okay? I think that's good for you to know in Norway because they didn't believe me. Okay? Um, so there we are, treading on kings. Joel Sternfeld is very well known for uh, photographing America, uh, the white trash America, and the high line before it became the high line, etc. So he came to me once, even though he was showing at Pace Wittelstein, to say, ah, I have something for you, Juan. I said, really? For me or for white box? Well, for white box. And, uh, I have this idea. I said, well, tell me about it. Send me an email. I said, no, no, I have a whole catalog I made myself. I went to uh, Genoa, the GA, to protest. I, they beat me up. They, they took my camera. Right? The Italian police and the European Union. <laughs> and he managed with a tiny little camera to interview people like the fellow on the left-hand side. This is Bush entering the Barilla project, and that was White Box in the middle. And, you know, um, I had a very beautiful experience, uh, speaking of um, White Cube, etc. cetera. Um, Mr. Wildenstein came, loved the project, loved the idea. They were around the corner from White Box, right new in the neighborhood of uh, Chelsea. Let's help you out with the funding because there was no funding. They couldn't find one single collector of Joel Sternfeld and sells for thirty, forty thousand dollars a photograph who would really buy one of these photographs to back the project, not because they wouldn't like to, but because their wives, their colleagues, the ones at work and their hedge fund operation would be ashamed of having helped such left-wing project. Many of them collectors. I mean, all of them collectors. Now, Kyle Goen, um, one of the most consequential uh, political artists, part of BOT, the collective, um, golf BOT collective, yeah? <coughs> so he answers without um, particular uh, um, regard for the questions. He says, we see simmering edifices of cultural wealth erected on the backs of hyper-exploited labor, the pyramids and coliseums of the 21st century, and land turned into concrete. We see museums, galleries, and public art projects serving as the avant-garde of displacement and dispossession. We see so-called social practice, the well-funded bureaucratization of alienated people's desire for community, effectively normalizing oppression rather than engaging in struggle. And we see theoretically savvy discursive platforms that speak of radical democracy, militant ecology, and even communization, while recoiling at the prospect of deploying their considerable resources, skills, and potential for the purposes of building a transformative movement. The answer thus cannot exclude the fact that we are all implicated and that the art world is so thoroughly intertwined with capitalism that there's no space and little time left outside of it. When I think of art after Occupy, I imagine art under erasure. We strike art to liberate art from itself, not to, un not to end art, but to unleash its powers and direct action and radical imagination. I like a political artist that uses imagination. Sometimes it's forbidden. This was Walmart doing Occupy. All the Occupy happened, and I knocked out another funded project to kick in a bunch of um, young artists, mainly this time. Yeah. Speaks for itself, and most of the people there you don't know. Some you do, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, I just loved it. We had performances and so forth. And Guernica is self, uh, you know, uh, explanatory. But it was done on the 70th anniversary, also very right after the 9-11 um, <coughs> the uh, knocking down of the towers. So it was very done. And I'm giving my two minutes um, 
Fenn, um, Arab Springs coincided with the Arab Springs. Peter Fenn has been a fabulous um, artist, you know him around here. Um, that is a very sad one. That was also another moment of politics. Two shows melt into one. This is George Bush heads inside uh, soccer balls and people were able to play with them. All ladies would come and I would tell my people at the reception, don't look at them and they would just kick them so hard, especially <laughs> all ladies, all Democrats from New York. Ah, uh, of course, a Galleria Minima, the, the long as the thing, you couldn't touch it and you need, I promise I sent two people would be looking over these beautiful objects. Um, and that was um, Pierre Restani, a fabulous, uh, just before he died. Um, so, um, Gail Elston, an attorney in the arts, um, number four, says, the playing rules are those of capital, as in das Kapital. The message is distorted, fractured, used, contorted, suppressed and co-opted by the art world actors. Elisa Mohamedou, the economist, um, um, she says, if we speak of market, then we speak of supply and demand. The political message can become more powerful if it meets an existing or latent demand. Victor Hugo once said that nothing is more powerful than an idea whose time has come. The market is never neutral. It will give attention to the message that maximizes benefits as in any economic market. And lately, the last one, Honorable Stephen Honigman, <coughs> who saved the Navy from the Navy itself. The message, number four, what happens to the political message when it encounters the playing rules of the art market? He says, the message can be attenuated, diluted, and compromised, some of which may be necessary or unavoidable. But again, the artist has a responsibility to maintain the art's true intent and immediacy. He places it on the artist. Thank you. Any questions? We have three minutes. 